our next uh, guest, we're going to do something a little bit different and just sit down in a, a casual living room setting <laughs> here with, with all of our, our close friends uh, with uh, a very talented person who is a writer and producer and star uh, songwriter uh, extraordinaire of the show Crazy Ex-Girlfriend. I love, I love it so hard, it's so smart. Uh, she's won this thing called a, a golden, it's gold, right? A golden yeah. globe. Oh, yeah. gold. And a, and a Critics' Choice Award. Please give it up for the exceptionally uh, brilliant Rachel Bloom. But I'm gonna hug you like I did just see you. Oh, oh I have a mic. On. Hi. This isn't my place, but one more hand for Maggie. That was amazing. Stand up. Oh, she's over there. She's over there. Oh, hi. Great. That was so funny. My husband has a bunch of missing teeth. And he has like his bottom teeth are all fucked up. He went to like a janky orthodontist in Long Island that completely fucked up his mouth. And he has to adjust his smile. He only shows the tops of his teeth. That's just his life. And that's my life too, by extension. <laughs> this is what I live with every day. You're brave. Great start. <laughs> you're a brave woman, yeah. And, and Do you're we saving up to help him with so that. So what's your, yeah, what's your favorite dental hygiene store? No. Uh, I, well, I actually, I was just at the dentist and I, um, I, j I just had nitrous for the first time. I'd never yeah. done it before because I don't have particular, I don't have a lot of anxieties with the dentist, but they gave me the option. You guys, uh. always do the nitrous <laughs> at all ages. Baby to 105. Just do the, it's great. Well, that's yeah, been, no, that's been yeah, my time. Um, <laughs> Good life advice, and it helps you laugh too. It's Laughing wonderful. Fast. It makes yeah. me look forward to going to the dentist. I'm excited to get my next billings. If, if only we could get that at uh, in all of our shopping and medical experiences, I feel like. I know. <laughs> we'd be onto something and high all the time. Um, so you were a skeptic, yes? Yes. And uh, we don't have any particular identifier. I think there's all kinds of people here. So how many people here identify themselves as skeptics? Four. A lot, and not everyone. Um, so. Since we use a lot of different words for those things. It's Let's like see the baby's hands. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Just all the babies are oh. like, hey. <laughs> Oh, I may change my cult evaluation. <laughs> oh, so close. Uh, so what does that mean to you? What, why is it important? Well, I went on, I mean, it, it kind of ties into my, like, I guess for lack of a better phrase, spiritual journey. So, like, I was raised like secular Jewish. I mean, it, it's very weird being Jewish in America because it's it's a religion that also is a race, which also is a culture. And it's very, very hard to define. I just had, side note, I just had a very brief run-in with members of the alt-right online because I tweeted something. I, I like live tweet our episodes, and we had an episode uh, that involved one of our characters, her uh, uh, one of our, our actors on the show, Vela, who's half black, half white, and her boss was like trying to say to her, like, what are you? In a very kind of like <laughs> white privilege way. And I had tweeted like, fellow white people, be mindful of this interaction and learn from it. And there's this alt-right account that looks for the phrase fellow white people and finds, <laughs> oh, wow. and finds well, and specifically finds Jews who say that. Um, because their whole point is, you're not white. Jews aren't white, and their whole the alt right's whole thing is that oh, wow. we're trying to create a culture of whiteness being a culture. Forget that, like, you can have Swedish pride and Polish pride and American pride, whatever. That's a, another thing. Um, but but it was very interesting because we're in this very weird space where if you ask some Jewish people, they'll say, "No, we're not white," because I mean, I went to. I mean, I, I, I took a trip to Auschwitz because um, I'm weird. Um, I went alone, and I was walking around Auschwitz, and I was like, oh, I, wow, shit, I'm not white. Like, I, according to these people, I'm not. But on the other hand, someone should get that. I think it was a phone, right? <laughs> uh, but on the other hand, 
I 100% benefit from white privilege. Anyway, so it's a very weird, it's a, it's a, it's a very weird space to be in. So anyway, I was raised secular Jew. Um, it, it kind of had a vague sense of spirituality. Also, I'm an actor, and so very fall into that kind of like, well, feelings become beliefs, right? And like, the, the way I kind of lived my life was this vague, like, well, if I mess up, it's okay because the universe meant it to happen or whatever, right? It was this kind of vague belief about the universe and everything happening for a reason. And really what I was doing was it gave me a sense of both comfort but also a way for me to justify my own shortcomings and mistakes. Um, and then when I got into, like around the time of late college, this is, I don't know, I feel like this sounds like such a college-y privileged story, but it's true. I took a trip to South Africa and I learned a lot about apartheid. And I went to Robben Island, which was the political prison during apartheid. And you get a tour of Robben Island by an actual former prisoner. And it was just, it was an immersion in this terrible time in history in, in, in a place where it was horrible to, you know, have a certain color of skin. And I remember thinking, like, how arrogant of me to say to myself, everything happens for a reason. Mm -hmm. that, that, is, that is a position of privilege to believe that everything Oh, everything has its purpose. What, what about the people living in these, you know, townships who, right. who are dying of disease and miserable? So, so that kind of, I just remember that moment of being like, wait a second, what if there's, for the purposes of me being a better person, what if I believe for a second that there's no cushion? That everything I do, there's no, like, overarching plan. That what if I'm fully responsible for my actions and I'm fully responsible for making my life better? and for being nice to people. And I've just been kind of riding on that revelation for the past 10, 12 years with, with a lot of, w it, it's taken like a lot of mutations. I'm still growing, I'm still learning it. And I got into skepticism because, so I did this music video called, I'll just curse, there are children, but sorry. Uh, I did this music video called Fuck Me Ray Bradbury like 10 <laughs> years ago, thank you. Thank you. Um, and that came from being like, so I, I always loved sci-fi and <coughs> fantasy, and doing that music video got me more into the kind of skeptic community, and I became friends, especially with this guy, Brian Dunning, yeah. who we were talking about backstage, who's right. so, so lovely and sweet, and hanging out with him and other skeptics, I realized, oh, it's not about like taking the piss out of things, it's about people who desperately want this stuff to be true, but just want it to be true in a real, in a real way, and not just kind of believe it for the sake of making oneself feel better. And as a kid, I was super into like ghosts and aliens and the occult. When I was 11, I like almost became a Wiccan. And so like <laughs> my headspace is there and you often find that with people who are into sci-fi and fantasy and also sketch comedy because the love for sketch comedy, I often find overlaps with the love for the high concept because that sketch comedy comes from like a high concept place. and. So, yeah, so, and, 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 I, and then I think another, sorry, this is like the longest yeah, answer, great. but I think um, another aspect of my skepticism comes from, so I just remember being, so I've been affected my whole life very much by like romantic obsession, um, as evidenced by the fact I'm the make, I co <laughs> create a show about it. And I remember as, as a teenager in early college, like being obsessed with like, well, let me check my horoscope today. There was this website where you could check, um, this thing called biorhythms, <laughs> where you'd put in your birthday and the other birthday of your crush, and you'd see like if your biorhythms were go going together. And I just, that clinging to something, anything to feel like there's order, um, is something I now kind of rebel against because it was me falling into my own emotion to the detriment of my own happiness. And it was very much helped by pseudoscience-y things. And so I am I remain a skeptic. I'm, I'm a little more open-minded and less dogmatic than I was a couple years ago. Um, I definitely went through a period where I was one of those really annoying skeptic atheists where someone would be like, I'm on a cleanse. I'd be like, ha, that's bullshit. We all go through that. And also, right? like, keep in mind, I'm an actor living in Los Angeles. <laughs> Everyone I know is always on a cleanse. <laughs> And so there it, are energies. There's just there's things well, you need to. There is energies, and that's terrifying. how you lose weight, I guess. I don't know. Um, <laughs> um, but I think that that's why it's still an important part of my life is to separate the pseudosciency false stuff going on 
in the industry and with my friends that maybe makes us less, I don't know, keeps us from achieving our true potential of intelligence and health, um, and from maybe stuff that might not be scientifically accurate but isn't hurting anybody and makes everybody happy. So it's, it's a constant, I don't know, I'm still growing it's every day. But you're yeah. on a higher vibrational frequency. Well, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously. It was funny. We were watching, if anyone's watching this latest season of Top Chef, there's this one chef on there with a real curly mustache. Uh, he's a real hipster. <laughs> and he's calling his, there's a, there's a scene, there's a, there's a moment where he's like Skype, he's calling his girlfriend on FaceTime and he's like, yeah, baby, I, I, uh, I really, I reoriented my crystals today and like, I really like, I got to that next level. And you see like, he carries around crystals in his pocket. And I was like really rooting against him. I was like, oh, hope Mr. Crystal fails. <laughs> and then, the challenge related to the Super Bowl, and he says in the confessional, he's like, I don't get sports. And I was like, I like him again. <laughs> <laughs> Rooting for Mr. Crystals. You go, Crystals. Like, I was like really excited. You, you almost have to translate it. It's, it's, it's like the teeth thing. The, the crystals are, it's love. Like, I don't get the whole crystal thing. The, the, I, Where in does his, that come in from? In his mind, I, I don't know. Bless my, you. I remember Bless my, you. my mother warning me when I was a kid if I felt some bad energy to, to remove that necklace because it was probably the crystal. I think there's probably some, <laughs> something generational. That is like a plot she point in the last anymore. book of Harry Potter. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I get where and that comes from. And there's a narrative. And this, uh, but, but for that guy, like, I reoriented my crystals or recalibrated my crystals for you, man. I'm really thinking about you. And, I, like, I'm terrible at this. So I'm always trying to run it through that filter of, like, what is, what language, we're using different language, but what does that mean? But, but you can always right. just say thank you. Yes, of course. <laughs> well, and the, I think also there have been a lot of studies about the, oh, am I, am I popping my peas? Is that me? Pop, pop, I don't care, it's fine. Um, <laughs> there have been a lot of studies about the placebo effect and how it can be just as effective the, the way that you can trick yourself and, or, or, or whatever it is, the placebo effect, like, believing that, something is helping can often be as powerful as something actually biologically helping. And I think that's where I'm moving more towards now, just um, um, I, I like to say that I'm a, my kind of the way I've been thinking about it is that I'm a theoretical agnostic in that I know very little. <laughs> like, you know, the, the best scientists on earth still know very little about the universe, so that means I know nothing. <laughs> um, but a practical atheist, because that's what makes me the best version of myself, is to believe that I am, every day I am responsible for the way I am and the way I treat people. And that's, and the two don't really relate to me, like what governs the universe versus what governs me. I, I, the two are kind of two separate things. I like that. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, sometimes you represent that on the show. In, in the opening episode, one of the things you say is, uh, you know, oh, God, you're talking to him. I, I don't pray because I believe in science. Yeah. Do, do you ever get negative feedback from people about those kinds of things? We know you hear from the alt-right. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> oh, I, I, God, I guess know, more broadly, what kind of negative feedback do you get, and how does it come, and how do you deal with it? Oh. Can we relive all of it right now? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's hard. I don't deal well, I still don't deal well with criticism. Um, my writing partner can like read the Reddit of our show and it's, and it's, well. and it's basically mainly supportive people but I see one insult yeah. and I, I still crumble. And this is a, an overall thing of anxiety and like lack of self-worth that I'm still dealing with. That's, that's you know, being kinder to myself. Um, and it's just, um, it's really, it's really hard. It still messes me. I'll tell you something bad that happened. So, um, and I haven't talked about this like a lot, but because um, it's honestly something that still hurts me. Um, but about a year ago, I did a song for Bill Nye's show, and it was a song that, like, I, I, I was in the thick of production, and I was so tired. And I agreed to do some stuff on his show because I'm such a fan of his. Oh, nice. And I get to like, and it was like a song that I was supposed to learn and I get to set and I like hadn't really learned the song and there was like choreography and I hadn't really learned it. And it wasn't really a comedy song, it was just more like a weird, quirky song. It's not usually the type of stuff I do. And I performed it and I was like, eh, I don't think that was like the best thing I've ever done, like both in performance wise and like maybe content wise, but I've done, I'm a sketch comedian who does stuff on the internet. I do stuff all the time. I mean, there are so many sketches I can point to where I'm just like, eh, maybe not my best work. That like, you just, 
what I learned is that you do these things, and if you're not super proud of it, you just kind of never hear about it again, and I was happy to, like, work with this person. Anyway, I, I forget about it, and, like, six, seven months later, I go on Twitter. It's, like, the first day of the Crazy Ex Writers Room, and there's this headline that's, like, how at Rachel Does Stuff and Bill Nye ruined <laughs> comedy, science, and music. Oh and no. it was Breitbart and basically every alt-right thing had picked up this song that I did, which is like... What's with the alt-right? Um, I don't know. Well, the song was about... The song was part of the episode about the sexual spectrum. And so it was a song, a very innocent... It was, it's just kind of a quirky song, honestly. It's not really a comedy song as much as a quirky song about how, like, do what feels right. Sexuality's on a spectrum. Like, that's it. It's a very, very innocent song. And I'm just like... I'm just not super, like, practiced at it, and the song's, like, a little low for my voice, and it's just more of, like, a not-my-best performance, and, like, I got eviscerated. I, ev eviscerated. I mean, it was, it was tweet after tweet of, like, you have no talent. You're a piece of garbage. You're a piece of Jewish garbage. You're, I mean, people, um, I found out that some, like, very, very fringe blog found a letter to the editor that my father had written to our local newspaper in like 1997 about how he goes on a lot of business trips and they were like, she grew up with a negligent father and they found my mother's Facebook and found some posts on her Facebook and like ripped into her. And just like the vitriol, I think what hurt was like, not so much the vitriol as much as like the vitriol for something that like I barely, that like I couldn't fully stand behind, not because I couldn't stand behind the message or the people behind it, but like just because like it wasn't like my best performance and I also, it was something that I didn't write. And I think the whole thing was, it really fucked with me. It, it, it really, and it still uh, hurts me. And it's something I'm still actively working with because it's kind of your worst fear when you have anxiety and you catastrophize, you go to these catastrophic places of, uh, I'm gonna do something and not look talented and everyone's gonna hate me. That's the musical theater kid's fear, right? right? Yeah, yeah. And that's like literally what happened. Like I did a thing where I wasn't my most talented self and everybody hated me, which is what it felt like. And it was a weird thing where when you have the conservative right or the alt-right attacking you, and this is maybe just ev ev like, you know, of the evidence of the bubble that I live in, you go outside of the internet and it doesn't exist. And no one else on the internet, anyone whose opinion I care about, didn't know this was happening because it was all alt-right websites. You, you all, if you noticed it, you just have to look at my mentions. And so it was like, it was really traumatic. And so the answer is like, I don't know. It's really, really hard and it's really scary. And I luckily mostly have a very supportive fan base, but that incident and a couple of other things is the reason like I've tr scaled back a little bit on social media because it's a place, and this is the internet in general now, but like it's a wonderful place. I got career success through it, but it's also a place filled with a lot of tribalism and vitriol. And, and, I, and, the, and the weird thing is like I've seen, there was this video online years ago called Give Me That Christian Side Hug. If you haven't seen it, <laughs> check it out. I am, yeah, yeah. It's a weird, it's a very cringy video done at this like mega church and it's like a song, it's a hip hop song called Give Me That Christian Side Hug about how true Christians don't front hug because your genitals touch and so you need to side hug. <laughs> and here's the thing, do I think that video is like embarrassing? Absolutely. Do I make fun of it? Absolutely. Would I ever reach out to those people and be like, right. you're garbage and you need to kill yourself? No. Not so much. I, that wouldn't even like occur to me. Like. I, it just, that's not where my headspace is at. So I think that the dealing with the like, the when you start to get into the space of getting people attacking you, like you're garbage, you should kill yourself. It's like, oh, you're in pain. And that's you're what, stuck. I mean, Sarah Silverman just did a wonderful thing. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Reaching yeah, out to one of her that. trolls. And it was like, mm -hmm. yeah, like people who write things like that, who troll like that, basically, I guess anyone on Breitbart it <laughs> is, in deep amounts of pain. And so it's something that I'm very much, so the answer to your question is I'm very much still in it. Yeah. And you know, everything happens for a reason or whatever, <laughs> that, that's not true. But, but I think that experiences like that have taught me a bunch of things, which is like, you know, do stuff in public that I'm proud of so that I can like stand behind it. Um, but also like you can't, gauge your self-worth off of like what 
you, you can only get yourself worth off of like what you think and then what people who respect who you respect think of you. It, there's like two like that. It, it, otherwise, you'll you'll go crazy. I mean, and and it's something that I'm actively still working on. Like right now, like I'm actually like trembling a little bit sharing oh this no. story be because it still causes it me anxiety. I mean, it, it really like it really got to the core of everything that I fear about myself, which is that I'm not talented, that I'm worthless, and that I'm only as good as the most recent thing I did. And this pain from this experience took me into writing the third season, and I'm so proud of this third season because it is so vulnerable, and I do think that had a hand in some of that pain, but like, I'm still not used to the personal vitriol from other people. Now, the anti-Semitic stuff doesn't get to me as much. There's this whole other subset of the alt-right that's obsessed with, I have a, another music video online called You Can Touch My Boobies. <laughs> um, that's all about basically, it's, um, it's a sexy music video within the mind of a 13-year-old boy that's based on my own diary entries Aww. writing erotica when I was 10 years old. <laughs> that's what it's based on. <laughs> But I couldn't, so I wanted to do a sexy music video in the mind of the way a 10, 11 year old would write it when you're starting to go through puberty, but I'm a girl, so I put it in the m mindset of a boy. And around the time the Bill Nye thing happened, people also targeted that video because they're like, oh, you're a Jewish pervert. And you start to get into that like, okay, so the narrative is that you wanna promote a culture of pure whiteness and that the Jews are somehow infiltrating the whiteness and trying to encourage everyone to be perverts. And so that stuff doesn't mess with me as much because that's just like. Farcical. It's just, a f it's just far, it's science fiction, yeah. right? That's not true, that's science fiction and I find it uh, amusing obviously until I'm hauled away to a concentration camp <laughs> um, and then it's not funny anymore. Um, <laughs> but I think dealing with others' hatred right now <coughs> is really the amount of hatred that other people have. Um, it's very scary. It can be very scary. So you, but you tackle a lot of really hard subjects you know, in, in your work, um, like addiction and mental illness and suicide, abandonment, um, and it's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so do you think, does, does humor make it easier for, for people to deal with and receive those ideas, or do you think there's a contradiction there as I think it does because in order to laugh at something you have to recognize a common experience if that's why comedy is so subjective if someone's telling a joke if I'm like if, if I'm telling a joke up here and I'm just like you know when you guys go to Antarctica and it's like where are the donuts that makes no sense right because that's not a common experience that anyone has here like that's not a good joke that's a weird fucking joke it's that's not a joke, that's I mean, just a thing. But like, valid. if we'd all been to Antarctica, <laughs> and we know that there's a lack of donuts, you'd be like, oh my god! Oh, so on point, and so... <laughs> 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 and so there's um, the idea of depression or mental illness or anxiety being funny implies that there is a commonality. And I find that so wonderful and refreshing because when my anxiety has been the worst, I f it's when I feel alone that I'm the only one having it. And this started when I was like 10, 11, and I started to get what I now know are like, basically I had OCD and like these looping thoughts and you think I'm the only person who think, who's thinking these things, I'm the only person who's feeling these things. And just nine times out of 10, that's not true. And I think that's, for me, it's lovely and I often say writing the show and writing the stuff I do, it, it feels like I'm spitting poison out and that I'm like sharing it with the world and other people sharing their pain with me I don't know, it just slowly feels like we're healing each other. And, and I, we were talking about the book, So You've Been Publicly Shamed, which is this amazing John Ronson book. And he talks about the people who really overcome public shamings and the fact that like, what they do is they're just not ashamed of it. They're very open about it. And I, I really have come to, I don't know if it's spiritual or religious or whatever, but like the idea that like openness about everything, I think is, I don't know, the way to, peace in my head because being angry at another person, you kind of, in order to be angry at someone, you have to ignore their humanity and you have to ignore their side of the situation. And the fact is nobody wants to be a villain. Everybody wants to be like, 
the hero of their story, which is like kind of quoting a song from my show, which is gross, <laughs> but whatever. Um, <laughs> but everyone wants to believe that they're the hero of their story. Everyone wants to believe they're doing a good thing. And something very interesting in the John Ronson book is that the reason people publicly shame people, and this includes trolls, this includes you know Breitbart or whatever, is that they feel like they are coming from a righteous place. For they are signaling. Yes, they are not for Jew signaling, right? Um, <laughs> wait, did you say Jew signaling? No, virtue. Oh. <laughs> We, we, we had a, a, hol a Holocaust Full joke in that. on thought that you were like, for Jew signaling, <laughs> and I was like, ha yes, Anne. Um, yeah. I'm a quarter uh, Jewish, so I can say that's that. That's fine. Okay. Um. <laughs> but I think that that's very telling, is that this amount of vitriol that we're feeling <laughs> throughout human history comes from people thinking that they're doing the right thing, and it's that mix of, like, righteous tribalist anger with like I'm the virtuous one. That's how you get like stone throwing as yeah. part of the culture. Yeah. yeah, and I think that when you recognize the humanity in other people, you can't do that as well. I know that, I mean, I know that like um, what sucks is when I recognize the humanity in someone that I so want to hate and I'm like, ah, I can't hate you anymore. Cheers. Cheers. You don't there's like a rush. Sports. Oh, I, I don't like sports, but I understand why people he do. He has a mother. Oh. Ah, he has a mother. <laughs> yeah. So, if we could just get serious for a moment. Not that, that wasn't not that the Jew thing <laughs> wasn't serious. <laughs> it's uh, good. This this one. Uh, this was a question from Cole. What is your go-to karaoke song? Oh, <laughs> Baby Got Back. Oh. How, how does that? How does that? Because it go? doesn't make me think. How does that yeah, one how does go? That, how does it sound? <laughs> oh. <laughs> I can't. Are you trying to get me to lead everyone in a <laughs> church chorus <laughs> of, of <laughs> Sir Mix-a-Lot's Baby Got Back? <laughs> I like big butts and I cannot lie. <laughs> you other brothers can't deny. that. When a girl walks up with an itty bitty waist and a round thing in your face, you, you get strong. Want to pull up tough because you noticed that butt was. Okay, you get it. Yeah, you, you bowed, you've outdone this. Why, why does every Sunday assembly end up with that song? That's what I mean. We have not done that one yet. I really go back and forth if that song is feminist or not. <laughs> <laughs> because he's like little in the middle, but you got much back. So that imposes like a, um, a, a, a body type bags. that's very hard, which is little in the middle, but you got much back. <laughs> it's hard to be little in the middle if you got much back. It's, it's hard. The more back you have, the l chances it's are. It's hard the to deny the objective. The more middle. The objectifying that's happening. Well, 100%. Yeah, right. It's ultimately <laughs> not a feminist song. But, but he goes like, Cosmo says you're fat. Well, I ain't down with that. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's very. It, it Thank you, Sir Mix a lot. Feels. <laughs> Feels so good to be the yes. body type that oh, someone's objectified. Another, another comedian, another, this is not my joke, someone co pointed out that the conversation at the beginning of Baby Got Back technically passes the Bechdel test. <laughs> yes. Two women talking about oh something Oh my God, look at her man. butt. It's so big. Ugh, she looks like one of those rap guys, but they're not really talking about a man. They're, they're shaming a woman. Yeah, we, we, forgot, about, we forgot about being catty with that, that yeah. test. We yeah. <laughs> needs a disclaimer. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, you were talking about uh, going back into the third season kind of with some, some fire in your belly. Yeah. Um, how, how does it work when you're, you're creating something and you're tied in that schedule of making new things uh, to expose yourself to new influences? Is, is that difficult? Yeah. I mean, I was when we were talking about a little bit backstage, you really see how artists who get successful atrophy because you're surrounded in a feedback loop of yes, um, you, first of all, are so busy with your own work, you don't expose yourself to other work, and then you become, and this isn't the case with me, but you see with people where, like, they become so successful, they only hang out with other people who are of a certain success level or, like, socioeconomic class, and so the answer is having, honestly, having people around to call you on your shit, and, I mean, for me, I mean, most of my job is not doing the red carpet thing, the red carpet press thing, that's a different job, my job is being on set 18 hours a day with a group of people creating work, but I think surrounding yourself with people who do challenge you and know ultimately what you're going for, but can be like, you can do better. 
I think that's really, really important. And I come from live comedy, which I don't know any other way to get good at writing or to get good at art in general to, I don't know how you get good at it in a vacuum. For me, it's always been about surrounding myself with people who are better than I am and, and, and better at something than I am so that I can constantly hold myself to a higher standard, but it's hard. And you, you talked about how, like in live comedy, you can come out and tell the Antarctica joke and it, it pans because no one gets it. Right. Uh, when you're writing, so especially since your, your humor comes so much from vulnerability and being able to share these things, uh, how, what, how do you find out that they do resonate with other people? Like at what point do you uh -huh. get to find out if it's gonna land? Um, well, table reads. That's, which is like a live play, basically version of the, when you go around and read the script. Um, the fact that you do, on our show, you have a writer's room, so there are 10 people to give you feedback. There's my writing partner, Aline. There are, I co-write the songs on Crazy X with two other people, Jack and Adam, and so the three of us give each other constant feedback, and so there's never anything done in a vacuum. I mean, I think what I've learned, once you, you know, put in that 10,000 hours, like, you start to get a sense, okay, this, this is what other people are responding to. This coincides with the feeling that I have, which is, oh, this feeling of like vulnerability or like, I don't know, like you start to get a sense of like, even without other people's feedback, oh, this is, I know this is good. And it's a feeling, I can't really, I don't know, it, de it just de depends. But I've found that the specificity that comes through being honest and vulnerable seems to work. Nine times out of ten. Nine times out of ten. Yeah. And then there's the one out of ten that I'm just like, I'm garbage, I'm garbage. <laughs> <laughs> Those hit the cutting room floor. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh. Well, I, I just wanted to check on, on something really quickly that overlap. How many people are uh, science fiction fans? <laughs> okay. okay. Yeah. It holds up in sketch, sketch comedy. Yeah, I think it's, it's pretty spot But on. it makes a lot of sense. It's the same place in my mind because I fell in love. My roots are in sketch comedy, and I wrote for a sketch group for years. I wrote for the show Robot Chicken, which is all a science fiction kind of pop culture yeah, show. Yeah, yeah. And like that, it all ties together because you're looking at these, you're creating a new world, you're exploring other worlds, you're looking at high concepts and finding the like, mundane and those high concepts, th those all connect for me. Um, what would, what guest would it take for you to come back here uh, and watch in the audience? Oh, I, 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 I <laughs> what should, guest? Who should we, yeah, who should we get? Okay, or like, or like what snack over? or <laughs> 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 photo booth prop? <laughs> Um, this God. conversation isn't, isn't over. <laughs> <laughs> like, are you saying that would personally lure me back? I mean, yes. I would like to come back. I really want to bring my <laughs> husband to this, and this is great. This is awesome. I like people who can tell me things I don't know. So I really like scientists. Like, I, I'm, because I'm a comedian, I skip the parts on podcasts where people are just talking about their days. Because I'm like, eh, okay, I get it. You had avocado toast. All right. Um, <laughs> I like things that tell me things that I don't know. So I don't really care. I mean, I care, obviously, if you get a cool actor, I guess, or a writer, but I, I would care about, like, this person works at SETI, or this person is the moon. <laughs> it's the moon. <laughs> All right. Can we, can we work on, if can you we work can on the get moon? the moon, <laughs> I, I know someone am who knows the moon. here. Right, we were talking about that backstage. We have, I think we do have an upcoming SETI speaker. We've had a couple oh. JPL speakers. Oh, cool. I can't say, okay. can't say just yet. But I think but that's I'm interesting hopeful. in people who can tell me things I don't already know. I really like that. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. I think who else feels that way? Yeah. yeah. Thank, you, thank you so much for having this this close, intimate talk with us and 200 of our, and our, our friends. best friends. This was a lot of fun. Oh, this was so fun. Thank you for having me. This was lovely. Thank you. Oh.